Okay, so hello everyone and uh, welcome to the webinar that uh, we have for tonight. Um, the webinar is going to be a behind the scenes tour of the Ontario Turtle Conservation Centre. And if you're not familiar with this centre, it's just outside of Peterborough and um, it is a turtle hospital, but they also provide um, education and outreach, which is what we're doing uh, tonight. And they have a hatchling program and they also conduct uh, research. So they do lots of things and we'll hear about uh, all of that tonight. Um, so I guess I'll turn it over to our guest who is Wendy Beggs. Wendy is the education coordinator with the Ontario Turtle Conservation Centre. She has been with the centre since 2013 and I'm excited to hear all she has to share about turtles. So Wendy, I will turn it over to you. Thank you. Welcome everybody to the Ontario Turtle Conservation Centre. We're the only wildlife conservation rehabilitation centre in Canada that focuses exclusively on turtles. Uh, we have first responders that are placed throughout the province of Ontario. So we look after all of the native turtle species in Ontario. First responders are individuals, or veterinarians that have been trained by our doctor uh, in how to um, successfully uh, take care of an injured turtle and uh, until they can secure a ride here to the center, to our hospital if they need surgery. And how do they make it here? We have over 900 turtle taxi volunteers throughout Ontario again. Uh, these are just people in the community that um, want to uh, donate their time and their vehicle to transport injured turtles to the center from our first responders. And then again, um, turtles that have been rehabilitated and taken back to their uh, place of origin. So, uh, Behind these doors is our hospital. Follow me and let's take a look inside, shall we? So this is the area where turtles are going to be brought in and admitted to the hospital. Uh, you're going to be met by one of our hotline coordinators and we have here Kate. Mm -hmm. So she spends her hours answering the phone uh, any turtle related questions people are calling in they mm -hmm. found a ninja turtle what to do next where are we located and she's okay. going to um, um yeah, you know so guide them to the closest like uh, first responder to where they are depending on their area and um, or to bring the turtle here and, and when the turtle is brought into the center here yeah. uh, kate is going to admit the turtle and she's going to be asking some very specific questions one very important yeah. question is um, where did you nice find too. the turtle so that is extremely important that, because uh, all turtles need to be returned to their uh, place of origin. All turtles, when they're admitted to okay, the wonderful. hospital, they're going yep, to be x-rayed yeah. and they're going to be given okay, pain okay. medication. We'll talk soon. Okay. One thing you need to remember is if you find a ninja turtle and you're putting it in a container, please do not put water in with a ninja turtle. You can imagine turtles suffer fractures cracks to their shell and that is an opening or interway for water to actually get into the turtle's lungs. We'll take care of the turtle's hydration once it's admitted to the hospital. Turtles are given pain medication as well and all turtles are given a very uh, special ID number so and that goes on their chart which Kate is going to begin a chart for that turtle and she's going to give them a number and that number is going to be also transferred onto the turtle's care case and onto the container that the turtle is going to be uh, placed in. And then the turtle is going to be uh, taken into our turtle ICU unit. Let's take a look. So this is one area where uh, the injured turtles are going to be placed and they're gonna be monitored closely. They're gonna be receiving treatment. And this is a perfect spot because our doctor and our vet techs are in and out of this room frequently during the day. We're open now seven days a week. This is our busy time starting. And uh, 
started uh, the 1st of May and uh, we're open uh, from eight o'clock in the morning until eight o'clock at night. So if you do find an injured turtle, please call. If we don't answer the phone, it's because we're busy. Please leave a detailed message and a number to, you know, for us to contact you and we'll get back to you as soon as possible. If it is after eight o'clock at night and we're gone, please keep the turtle in a safe location in your home. You don't have to administer anything to the turtle. Just keep it in a safe place with the lid on so that it is uh, secure. So uh, here you, you can see that we have some patients here. And uh, then these are patients uh, from just this year. And um, after two or three days, this is where they're gonna also be given fluids too. And we give it uh, intravenously. And uh, this is where they're gonna be kept for two or three days. Turtles go into shock too. And uh, so our doctor will be the one to determine uh, whether it's time for them to go into surgery or not. Any surgery uh, or anything done on a turtle shell is orthopedic surgery because the turtle shell is made of bone, just like the bone that's you know in our bodies, in our arms. So we have uh, four doctors uh, here and we have many vet technicians. So this is a very busy time that we're heading into. Uh, it can be that we can admit up to 50 turtles in one day. And um, we're just starting it now. So we're all in place. We already have admitted some turtles so far. A uh, turtles just came out of uh, hibernation in April, around the first week of April. And it was really nice uh, there for a time in April. And we did have quite a few. They were out and about moving. And uh, the main um, reason that turtles are admitted to the hospital, the primary reason is uh, injuries by vehicles as they're trying to cross the many roads here in Southern Ontario. Southern Ontario uh, has uh, all, you know, a great, or did have a good population of turtles, um, the highest number of turtles. And of course we have the highest population of humans too. And uh, we change things, the landscape very quickly and easily, uh, but it's very difficult for turtles to adapt and keep up with those changes. And um, so therefore, um, unfortunately, all of our turtles, we have eight species uh, that live in Southern Ontario, all eight. And, um, and unfortunately, um, habitat loss in Southern Ontario is huge. Uh, we've lost over 70% of our wetlands. And so that's the main reason we are losing our turtles. After that comes early death by world mortality. So from here, everybody, the turtle, once our doctors decide it's time for surgery, they're going to go into the operating room. Let's take a peek at the operating room. Uh, there's no surgery going on at this time. There has been all day long, but um, it's getting close to eight o'clock and things are kind of winding down for us right now. So we're ready for another full busy day tomorrow. So you can see all the instruments and uh, what's been going on here. We, uh, as I said, all turtles are x-rayed. We wanna see if there's any internal injuries. And we also wanna see if it's a mature female, uh, if they're still grabbing with eggs. And that is often the case too. The females are hit, struck by automobiles before they've even had a chance, you know, to return to their nesting site and lay their eggs. So many times we not only get, you know, a severely injured female turtle, but with eggs. So we have a hatching program as well that we're gonna talk about. So we do x-ray them to see in our x-ray room is right next door. So let's carry on through. So you can see we have patients everywhere. Uh, we have right now about 1,300 turtles. We are releasing some now. And these are uh, a lot of hatchlings from last year's eggs that we were incubating. We had over 4,000 eggs. We did release quite a few last fall until the weather got cool. We started getting frost and then we have to cut that off. And um, then we just overwinter all of the, the remaining hatchlings until the nice weather like now. So we are just um, making arrangements for that. Staff is very involved. Uh, I'm involved. All of us staff is involved with the releasing the hatchlings due to the pandemic. So we are stepping up to that as we did last year. And um, so you can see here that uh, in these containers here are hatchlings. And then in these, all these containers here is one individual turtle. Remember, they're all from across Ontario. We need to keep them all separate. We don't want to transfer any bacteria. And of course, they're injured, so you're not gonna put them together. So follow me, we're passing the x-ray room. So here we are, um, 
I'd like to show you one snapping turtle here in this area. I think it's quite interesting. I'll meet uh, you on the other side. Are you able to do that? So this is a male snapping turtle here. So now this, everybody, is a very common injury. This happens when you know somebody comes upon a snapping turtle on the road. They're not sure on what to do, how to approach the snapping turtle, and uh, they make the decision to straddle the turtle with their car. It's not a good idea with the snapping turtle uh, because snapping turtles cannot retract into their shell. They have a very small reduced plastron, which is the bottom shell. What they do is just the opposite. Instead of you know trying to hide, which they can't do, they make themselves look as large as possible to the predator. And the predator in this case is your car. So they will raise themselves up on all four feet, almost take a bulldog stance, if you will, and therefore, when they raise themselves up, their carapace comes in contact with your car. So this is your muffler system or undercarriage of your car that does this damage. And then, of course, the snapping turtle is very much known for snapping. So they just see this dark shadow coming over them. They, they don't have no idea. They think it's a huge predator. And of course, they snap up with the undercarriage of your car. And you can see where a good portion of the turtle's beak has been uh, severely damaged and uh, removed. So uh, please don't do that. If you do see a snap and drill, I am going to show you how to successfully help it snap and drill cross the road safely. Uh, you're going to get off the road quickly with the turtle. Okay, so I've got a couple of methods that uh, I'm going to share with you. So here we have one of our vet techs, and she is actually, she's been taking care of our little snapping turtle hatchlings, and she's been, uh, yes, would you mind just sharing with oh, them I, what you are doing? Well, I was trying to keep a count of everybody, but there was one that was put in the wrong bin, so I'm microchipping. I'm, okay, I'm so we're just, we're just microchipping. So uh, she has been taking care of our little hatchlings, cleaning the tanks, and now uh, every snapping turtle hatchling is microchipped before they are released. So we're getting all of our little snappy turtles ready to go back. So follow me. I have a painted turtle I'd like to show you. So this is a little female painted turtle. I know it's a female just by looking at uh, her front nails, they're short. The males have long uh, nails. The three middle nails are quite long. Now this little turtle here, this is just an example of what we do. This little turtle was hit by a car as so many of them are. 90% of the turtles admitted to the hospital are due to automobile strikes. And they suffer sometimes multiple fractures. So this is a fracture. This is right where the turtle's lungs are. This is a fracture. So this piece here was right away from the main part of the turtle's carapace. We don't use glue uh, to hold the pieces back together. We don't use that because they hide infection. So we want the bone to heal together naturally. And we put it back in place and just hold it in place with white surgical tape. So in order for the bone to fuse together, they need to be touching very close. We don't want to have a gap. So that tape is going to hold that in place. Then the turtle is going to be put in the ICU unit. This turtle would have been x-rayed given pain medication and fluids because it wasn't given any water uh, when we found the turtle and we're not going to put it in water when it first arrives at the center either. Then after a few days of being in the intensive care unit and you know having pain management, uh, our doctor will then decide on surgery. So in the operating room, that's when our doctor um, installs this is orthopedic wire. Again, because anything done with the turtle shell is orthopedic surgery. So orthopedic wire. And this is only used through the marginal scoots, just the scoots on the outer edge, not in any area where there's gonna be flesh involved, okay? So just the marginal scoots at the back here or the front. So uh, in order for our doctor to do that, she has to um, 
install little holes so that she can thread through the orthopedic wire. She uses a very fine a dentist drill bit to do that. So you can see it's threaded from the bottom up through to the top. And then we just twist that nice and snug so it's not gonna be moving that uh, portion of that fracture and causing any discomfort to this uh, beautiful little turtle. And um, yeah, so turtles have a very slow metabolism. They will heal, it takes them a little bit of time, but really quickly, they do develop a barrier um, to prevent water from entering their body cavity. So that happens quite quickly. And uh, of course, we know where this little turtle is from. We got that information from the finder or the uh, volunteer taxi driver. And uh, so that's on the turtle's chart. And this turtle's number is on the chart. Um, so this little turtle is not gonna be released yet. Uh, she's been with us since 2019. Now, before any turtle is released from here, um, they're all going to be installed with a microchip. And we're gonna put the microchip in their left back leg. And any turtle that is admitted to the hospital, we're gonna scan them for a microchip as well. If they have that, uh, then possibly it is ours because we do microchip all of the turtles we release. And if that's the case, we're gonna have a file on that turtle if the turtle returns and it is one of ours. Uh, we're going to have a file, a history on the turtle, and uh, we're going to pull that out and we're going to look to see, you know, how far the turtle traveled in its habitat from the, the, from the first time it was found. A turtle's habitat can be anywhere from five up to 10 kilometers. So we can see how far the turtle traveled. And then and if the turtle was hit by a car the second time, we're going to look to see the location. And if it's close within the same area that it was struck the first time around, that could be uh, information on where we're going to put in eco passages, exclusion fencing, turtle crossing signs, et cetera. So great information we can gain and share um, globally with these um, microchips and what we can find out from the turtles. Every turtle has a chart when they first come in and it stays with the turtle. During their stay here at the center, everything is documented even to how much they eat every day. Our turtles are omnivores, they eat meat and vegetation. Uh, we feed them here. Uh, the small turtles, like the little hatchlings, the painted, uh, the snapping turtles, blandings. Uh, we give them a diet of, this is Maz, Missouri. It's just a little pellet. Lots of nutrients and vitamins in it for the turtle's health and healing. And then of course, uh, turtles being omnivores, uh, we feed them uh, meat and vegetation. So they get worm pieces. Uh, they get fish and they get green. So we feed them, you know, kale, any kind of leafy green lettuce, uh, that sort of thing. And um, again, they're not fed every day. They're fed three times a week. We couldn't do what we do here without volunteers. We have volunteers from the community and from universities and, and colleges that come in here and donate their time in the care uh, of our turtles. So follow me. We're going to go on into the center. But first... Let's stop here. So we just created this little board just to, you know, keep everybody you know, up to date on how many injured turtles we, we've taken in so far. Sometimes we don't get to it every day. We're just busy and, you know, that happens. But uh, it was updated yesterday and uh, we have uh, new patients, 121. Uh, that's, that's getting up there. Uh, but uh, we're going to have some nice weather now. And... Uh, the late May is really the time when turtles really start off the mature females to travel to lay their eggs. June is extremely busy. So you can see that we have 74 painted turtles. Middle of painted turtles are always at the top of the list. Um, you know, uh, in a year, I've seen us uh, admit about 700 of them. Yes. So, and then followed by the snapping turtle. That just seems to be uh, the way it goes, painted, snapping turtle blandings. Every year I've been here, that seems to be the way it goes. Now, northern maps, we never, well, I shouldn't say never, rarely get in uh, male northern maps. They just don't leave the water. So it's primarily the females that we see coming in here with, with injuries. So follow me, and uh, we're going to go on into the center. Now we have eight. Uh, species, as I mentioned, that uh, call Southern Ontario home. We're very fortunate to have all eight species. Let's check them out. 
So these are models. So and these models represent our turtles at an adult age. Now they will get larger. Turtles are always growing, but once they hit adulthood, they really slow down their growth, but their shell is always growing. So here we have the snapping turtle is our largest freshwater turtle. They can live to be upwards to 100 years of age. We know that, that's been proven scientifically. They're the only species that cannot retract into their shell. Uh, we have the Midland Painted Turtle. And all of our turtles are listed federally as a species at risk, as I mentioned. We have the beautiful Northern Map. And it's called the Northern Map because of the pattern on its carapace. The contour lines in that resemble a topographical map. We have our smallest freshwater turtle. All of our turtles are freshwater. This is the little Eastern musk turtle or the stink pot turtle. We're gonna talk about why they call this turtle the stink pot turtle. Now, all these turtles that I just introduced to you, you know, when you're talking species at risk, there's different levels. As it gets more serious, it's a different level. So the ones that I just introduced to you now, they're listed as special concern. So that's the first entry. You know, when you go, hey, what's going on? Turtle population, she's like saying, what is happening? And you start investigating. That's special concern. We need, to, we need to check it out and we need to nip this in the bud, what it is, and try to correct it so it doesn't get more serious. But if we don't, then it does get serious, more serious, and it goes up to threat. So we have one species in Ontario that's listed as threatened. That is the beautiful Blandings turtle. And this is the species that we are doing our research with the Blandings. We've just started our 10th year. And so we've been following, there are head started blandings, and we're following approximately 20 of these uh, beautiful species in the wild. Uh, we have a secret location. And um, so half of them uh, are, their cohorts are uh, blandings that were born in the wild. And then the other half are ones that were from here. And the, the eggs came from the injured females. And we kept them here for different stages of life. And we're releasing them every year at a different stage of life to see which is the best age and the best size to release these uh, Blandings turtles for survival. And what we learned from this, we share globally, of course, because, well, turtles are one of the fastest disappearing vertebrates on Earth. So we have been very successful uh, with our research and study. Our technicians are, of course, right now. Uh, out in the field they're doing this. They're away all week long tracking the Blandings turtles using radial telemetry. And um, they've been out in the field now for about uh, three weeks. And so things are really uh, looking good. And then of course, any other species that we find there, we report that and we keep an eye on those too. Like for example, spotted turtles and, and whatnot. So that is our research and study. And uh, so this is the only species right now in Ontario that's listed as threatened. When a species is listed as threatened, the turtle is protected, yes, and the turtle's habitat. So, you know, if a developer was to go in in an area where we know that there's blandings living there, they would have to get special permits and uh, a, a lot of paperwork in order to go in and develop, put a road in. They'd have to ensure that it was not going to affect the life of a blandings turtle. Where turtles that are designated as special concern, the turtle is protected. Protected against what? Well, they're protected against harassment, being taken from the wild as a pet. It is illegal to do that, uh, to be uh, eaten as food. They're protected against that um, from many, many things. So um, it is illegal to do any of that, to take a turtle from the wild, sell as a pet, take home as a pet, et cetera. Um, and then, uh, but their habitat is not protected. So if there's an area where people know that they're snapping turtles, turtles protected from trapping but you could put a road through there and, and you know, build a subdivision. Um, with the threatened species, their habitat is protected and the turtle. Now we've got three that are endangered. We have the wood turtle. Uh, this is our most terrestrial turtle and actually our most intelligent turtle. We'll talk about why this turtle is so intelligent. And then we have the little spotted turtle, beautiful little turtle. These two turtles are really sought after for the black market trade. Uh, smugglers and poachers will definitely go out and just wipe out a whole population by taking them, trapping them, and selling them on the black market. It is huge for our turtles. And then we have one last that's uh, an endangered species, and that is the eastern spiny softshell. So this is our only softshell turtle. Uh, it's very fusty on where it's going to live. It'll, it will only live in a body of water, like a river or lake that has sandy um, substrate 
or soften them up because they like to bury themselves. They'll bury themselves down to about three quarters of the weight and they can hide just like that. Uh, these are really super uh, turtles. Uh, every turtle is really unique. They have certain features that make them stand out from each different species. This turtle here can stay submerged for up to five hours without coming up for oxygen. Remember, turtles have lungs and they do need oxygen. How does this turtle do it? Because of its soft shell, uh, it can actually take and absorb oxygen from the water through its skin. So where are other turtles, they have to come up about every 45 minutes or so, get a quick uh, breath of uh, air, oxygen, get some oxygen, and then return, submerge. This turtle here, because it can take an oxygen through its skin, and it can take an oxygen through its throat, it'll just take a large gulp of water. Uh, it has lining its throat, all these little villis, and um, just the water laying across that, the turtle can absorb oxygen from the water into its bloodstream that way, and then it'll just expel the water. So five hours before this turtle needs to come up to the surface. And now I'd like to introduce you to our turtle ambassadors for our education program. These turtles, we have a special permit for because they are non-releasable. Uh, they are not candidates to be released back to the wild. And um, that is our goal, to take in injured turtles, heal them, get them rehabilitated, and get them back out. So it's like we're buying them time, but they hopefully will have time during their life to be able to leave behind two babies before they die. And that is a feat in itself for a turtle to do. It can take a snapping turtle 60 years to do that because of the high predation. So when turtles finally, say for example, this snapping turtle, this snapping turtle is just mature now. His name is Mr. D and uh, he's about 18 years old. And that's about the time that snapping turtles mature when they start to reproduce anywhere from 17 to 20 years of age. It actually takes a snapping turtle 60 years to successfully, all that length of time, laying eggs and all that, to maybe leave behind two babies to replace them before they die. Why is that? Just because of the predators today. There are so many predators, more than what there used to be. And that's because of us, because of our garbage and our huge agricultural farms, lands, like predators are thriving. Raccoons and skunks and foxes, they are thriving. And they are the primary predators of turtle nests. Usually a turtle, you know, they'll, they'll travel for two or three days. They do it once a year, sometimes twice a year, they're little painted, but they'll travel for two or three days. It's the time of year now to lay eggs. A snapping turtle can carry anywhere from 10 to 70 eggs. They spend about three hours digging the nest, depositing their eggs. They can't stay there with those eggs. It takes 80 to 90 days for them to hatch uh, with the heat from the sun. They have to get back to the safety of the water. There is no connection to the, the eggs or their babies at all. And um, those eggs are very vulnerable to predators. One person, actually a uh, snapper turtle's nest survival rate is less than 1%. It is actually 0.07%. Yeah, so if I had, this is a, let's just pretend this is a snapping turtle egg. This is what they look like about a ping pong ball. If I had 10,000 snapping turtle eggs here, whole pile, 10,000 snapping turtle eggs, out of that 10,000 eggs, only seven will ever make it to be a, a mature re, a reproducing turtle, snapping turtle. Only seven out of 10,000 eggs. That's, that's the percentage. So, you know, some individuals will say, well, I can't understand that turtles are listed as species at risk. I see lots of turtles basking on logs. You may, yes, you may see adult turtles out there basking on logs, but that is no guarantee that they've had a chance to leave babies behind. Most of those babies are dug up uh, before they even hatch, and, uh, and when they do hatch, so many predators go after the little hatchlings. If I had 1,500, 1,500 little baby hatchlings, and I asked you to get with me, and we were going to release them, and we went down to you know, the area where they came from, a river, slow, no current, all along that shoreline. And uh, we had all these uh, hatchlings. We separated them all. We released one and then walked 10 feet and released another one. We did it perfectly. And when we released them, we put them in all this vegetation so that as soon as we let them go, they were gone. You couldn't see them. 1,500. Out of those 1,500, one may make it. That's the odds. 
So uh, another reason why we're losing turtles is people see them and they take them from the wild and they take them home for pets. We can't do that. Um, you know, we need to leave these turtles in the wild so that they can continue to reproduce or we are going to lose them. So the snapping turtle here, um, Mr. D, he's with us because, well, you can see his injuries. He was actually hit by a boat motor propeller that damaged his spinal cord and it affected his back limbs. So Mr. D cannot walk properly. He can't stand up on all four and he cannot swim. So he is definitely a not releasable. We have a special permit for him from the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestries. Now, as you're looking at Mr. D, I'm gonna get um, Picasso. He is our little painted turtle. I'm gonna bring him up and we're gonna compare for a minute. So this is a beautiful little painted turtle, little male. So I showed you the female earlier. So you can see the male. I don't know, hopefully you can see his nails. They're quite long. They use them for mating. Uh, they will swim in front of the female and then they'll uh, use their nails to stroke the female's head. Uh, now, uh, with the, this painted turtle, you can see Mr. D's injuries. Check out the little painted turtle. Uh, do you see any injuries on him? Let me just show you his bottom shell. No, no. That's because this turtle was not injured. This turtle was actually kidnapped or taken from the wild. So this is what happens when people do take turtles from the wild and take them home, put them in an aquarium, look at them from time to time. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we do not know, we don't have, do not have his place of origin. It is illegal for us to take a turtle and just release them anywhere. All turtles have to be by law returned to their original habitat because if they aren't, they will wander off. Uh, the little hatchlings, when this turtle was a little hatchling, he was one of those, that 7% or 1% that survived, that that predator didn't eat that egg. He was one. And um, so when this little turtle made its way out of that nest and made its way to the water, it was at that point in time, imprinting its habitat, remembering everything, every step, everything. And it was, it's there forever that imprint. As they get older, uh, turtles lose that ability. So it's just something that it's when they're very young, that stays with them. But as they get older, they lose that ability. So when you do take an older turtle and release it somewhere else, they have a hard time remembering things. So they will just wander around, spend the rest of their lives wandering around, most likely looking for their habitat and not knowing why it's not there. So all turtles need to be returned to their habitat. And it's unfortunate because this turtle is quite healthy. Now, you can see that this turtle here can retract into a shell. All of our species can, but the snapping turtle. They can't do this because they don't have this full plastron. This is what we call the plastron. And you can see it protects all those vital organs and it enables this little turtle to hide in its shell quite a bit of protection. So when it feels frightened or threatened, or if a car was to drive over top of it, it wouldn't do anything, it would hide in its shell and hope for the best. The snapping turtle can't do that. So I'm gonna lift up Mr. D and I'm gonna show you his bottom shell. You've just seen the painted turtle. So check out his shell, see how small that is? Look at all that exposed flesh. The only thing that this turtle can do to protect itself, it can't move very fast, uh, it can't speak or anything like that and tell you what it's doing to be left alone. All it can do is bite, and that's what it'll do. So when you see a snapping turtle, never approach a snapping turtle from the front. It's got a very long neck and it's very quick. It can come straight out and it can come straight up and it can come to the side here. So if you put your hands at the bridge here, um, as you would one of these little turtles, you could get bit. So always put your hands at the back. And uh, I always suggest a turtle this size you can just put your hands right underneath the carapace here, over top of the hind legs. You can grab right a hold under, underneath. There's no flesh there. So I'm going to do that with Mr. D right now, just like that. You can see where my hands are. I'm safe. He can't reach me here. So I'm going to show you, as I mentioned, I was going to, how to safely help a snapping turtle across the road because you're going to be seeing them now. So let's go through that. I'm going to use a uh, this road here that we've got. So first I'm gonna 
talk to you about a snapping turtle, and then we're going to talk about the other species. So when you see a snapping turtle on the road, make sure that it's not laying eggs, okay? You don't want to disturb a female if she's laying eggs. That could be very dangerous for the turtle. So, and they're going to be there for a couple of hours. So you could stay and help them afterwards if you have the time. Um, but let's just say that the turtle's not laying eggs. You, you see the turtle, you pull off the road, you're walking back to help the turtle. One thing you can do is bring attention to any cars coming your way that you're going to a turtle on the road. And you can do that by just pointing your finger down to the road. You know, as you're walking, just point down. They may see you and go, oh, oh, there's a turtle on the road. That's where they're going. And hopefully avoid hitting the turtle. So you, you're getting... This turtle. You don't want to give him any heads up. So you're walking along. You're looking to see which way his head is pointing. Because that is always only the only direction you're going to take any turtle, any turtle, the direction that they're facing. You're not going to turn them around and take them back to the pond because honestly, you'll be gone down the road and that turtle 15 minutes later or maybe longer, will be right back out there in that spot going across the road. So I can't tell you why, but always take it in the direction that's facing. So you're walking along, draw attention, look to see. You see it's going that way very quickly. You walk up behind it, put your hands here. As soon as you do that, they feel it. There's nerve endings and blood vessels there. They're gonna be snap, 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 hang on tight. They can't do anything, they can't reach you. Carry it across the road, if it's safe to do so, of course. You look both ways, I hope. And then put the turtle down, release and retreat. So put the turtle down in the direction it was facing. Don't turn it a different way. Put it down, release. As soon as you put it down, move away. And I ask you to do that because if you stand there, the turtle will definitely turn around to look at its predator. It wasn't happy with what you just did and it thinks you're gonna do it again. So uh, put the turtle down and move. So there's that way for a turtle this size, okay? For a turtle that's that big, you're not gonna be able to lift it that way. So this is how you're gonna do it. You're going to do the same thing. You see the turtle, point down, get attention, and uh, you're walking up. You see which way the turtle's head is facing. That's the way it's going. You walk up to the turtle. This is a large snapping turtle. You walk up to the turtle. You're going to put your hands here, lift up the back end, turn it around, pull it across the road, turn it back around so it's facing the way it was when you first saw it, release, and retrieve. That way you don't even have to pick up the turtle, okay? And it's gonna be scratching on the road. Yes, it may get a couple little scratches or something on its feet, I don't know, but it's gonna be better than the car running over it, okay? So get it off the road. Those are two ways that will get you off the road and the turtle quickly. I lift the snapping turtle this way, I approach from behind. I go for this one I call the pizza lifting method, approach from behind. One hand I grab here, the other hand, I'm going to slide underneath and I carry it this way, supporting its body weight, but that's not necessary. You don't have to do that. Now with the little other turtles, <laughs> other turtles is a lot different. Well, you don't have to worry about being snapped. Back. Same thing, draw attention, same thing. Make sure you're safe. I'll look at the, which way the head's pointed, two hands, just in the middle, secure, hold the head away from you, carry across, and just put down in the grass on the other side, and that's all you need to do. And uh, this is a good time of year to get together a turtle safety kit or rescue kit. So here we have one made up. Just to give you an example, you could do this uh, a little project for the weekend if you like. It's just a Rubbermaid container with a lid. Uh, put some air holes in it, because turtles need oxygen. And in this kit, you could have a safety vest. And that's handy to have in your car at any time. If your car breaks down, you've got that. And uh, while, well, gee, everybody has hand sanitizer. Uh, let's say you're going to need a pair of gloves. Okay. And because you're not putting water with an injured turtle, you could just place a nice, clean, dry towel at the bottom, make it nice and comfortable. 
And then when you're picking up a turtle and you're helping it across the road, just take a quick look to see if it hasn't already been hit. You're looking for a little crack or fracture, maybe a little bit of blood. You see that? Make arrangements to bring it into us. And then you're all set to go. Just put the turtle in the container with the lid and give us a call. So I've introduced you to our largest freshwater turtle, which is the snapping turtle. And now I'm going to introduce you to our smallest freshwater turtle. And that's the little stink bar turtle. Now, these turtles here, they're both the same age, you know, within a year. Um, Mr. D here is 18. This little turtle here is 17 years old. Now, check out this little guy. Do you see any injuries on him? No. Let's check him out. No injuries. We have two of these little stink pots here. And uh, they're siblings, two males. They were unfortunately taken from the wild when they were just little hatchlings. And so they've been in captivity their whole lives. And that's a shame. They're listed as a special concern. So these little turtles here are nocturnal. They only come out late evening. Oops. <laughs> and they're fast. <laughs> <laughs> and these little turtles here, they can climb trees. Did you know that there are some species of turtles that can climb trees? Well, we have one right here. There's a little stink bot. He's on the move. <laughs> it looks like a walking river rock. Now, um, why do they call it the stink bot? You're probably wondering. Well, they have two pair of little glands that are tucked up here by their marginal scoots. And this turtle produces a liquid. It's a type of acid that they store in these glands. And it's very strong, musky smell, sort of like a skunk. So they store that liquid in these uh, two pair of glands, four little glands there. And when they feel frightened or threatened, they will release that, either you know, on your hand or the predator's mouth, whatever the case. And you'd want to put this little turtle down uh, to go wash your hands. Uh, this little turtle here will bite too, so you, you, uh, you'd want to watch. He's used to being handled, so he's okay. Now they have uh, stripes on their head, one above their eye and one below their eye. And they have these little barbs on their chin and they actually help a turtle, the turtle to find food or a mate. Now, uh, these little turtles here, uh, they have on their feet, well, all turtles have webbed feet, but they have these little barbs and they're all along their legs here and that, and that helps them to actually hang on to the bark of the tree when they're climbing. So they can climb trees that are about, you know, four to five feet in height. So, you know, if you had a sweater, so they really cling on. Now, because they're so small, I mean, uh, the snapping turtle, uh, they have very strong back legs. They're great diggers when they're laying their very delicate little feet here. So them being, uh, they're uh, nocturnal and they're highly aquatic. They rarely leave the water. And uh, the, the body of water, the bottom, the darker and murkier it is, the better, the more they like it. But they do, you know, they get old enough that they're, uh, it's time for them to lay eggs. They're not going to travel very far, uh, very close to the water. And they're going to lay their eggs just under leaf litter or maybe some decaying bark or maybe just in the crevice of a couple of rocks. You know, there's some soft, loamy soil there, but that's it. And then they're going to get right back to the water. We don't get into many of these but they do run into trouble with boat motor propellers the same as Mr. D did. Um, they like to live in an area that has a lot of vegetation and plants. So this is the little stink bot turtle. Um, again, he was kidnapped, taken from the wild. We have no idea where he came from and he certainly can't tell us. So unfortunately, he's gonna be in captivity the rest of his life too. So uh, again, we must leave the wild in the wild. So I'm gonna put this little guy back. I think we're finished. Well, I wanna say one more thing about this little turtle. They have a hinge and it's right in this area here. It's a very slight hinge on their plast run. So they can actually bend this part. You can see here, so it's kind, of, it's kind of flexible when I'm pushing on it, he's moving a little bit, but you can see that. So when they pull their head in, they can move that a little bit. Thanks buddy. And this is a little male. I can tell this is a male by the amount of flesh here uh, in the, uh, between their, uh, the scoots on the plastron. And of course, by his tail. The males have this little sharp uh, end on their tail. 
where the females don't. It's quite blunt, but the males have that. I want to show you a wood turtle. Very few people ever have the opportunity to see a wood turtle. They are one of our most endangered species. And as I said earlier, they're highly terrestrial. Um, they're almost tortoise-like in their behavior. And this species can eat on land, where our other turtles eat in the water. They need the water to swallow their food. So you would never see a snapping turtle eating on land. It is impossible. It needs the water, you know, to move that food around in its mouth. Turtles don't have teeth. They have a bony beak like a bird. They have a tongue, but they can't use their tongue like we can with moving the food around. So the water is necessary. This little turtle, no. So this little turtle in the wild, um, he would be eating mushrooms. He'd be looking for wildflowers, berries. He'd be looking for maybe visiting an apple orchard, looking for apples on the ground. And he'd be looking for worms, insects, snails, mushrooms. Now, this turtle is very smart. So when this turtle is, you know, in the mood for a worm on his diet or his menu, he'll walk along until he comes to a wet spot on the ground. He'll stop there and he'll start to thump or tap his feet. Sometimes they'll, they'll uh, thump their plastron on the ground or tap their feet. That sends vibrations down through the soil where that wet spot is. And if there's a worm in the area, perhaps a worm thinks it's raining, they will emerge, come to the surface. And that's when the turtle is just waiting for that opportunity. They'll grab the worm, pull the worm out of the ground. So quite an uh, intelligent species. Now you can see why they call this turtle the wood turtle. Check out how he blends in with this piece of wood here from his container. Now this is a male. And this is a high dome species. So any turtle that has a, a high dome shell like the wood turtle, the males will always be concave, their plastron. You see how that's indented in? And the females will just be convex or flat. So that's the same in any species that has a very high dome shell. The males will be concave, the females no. So Rusty here is here. Uh, take a look, you can see that he is missing his two front feet. So even though uh, you know, we have an adult turtle, he's roughly, he's a little over 30 years old, they still have predators. And uh, one would be river otters, especially when they're blue mating or hibernating in the wintertime. Another one is going to be well animals like foxes and coyotes, and even your dog can do a lot of damage to a turtle shell, uh, and raccoons. So his feet were severely damaged, he was spotted. Uh, Rusty was actually part of a catch and release, so he had a tracking device on him. He was part of a study for many years. And um, anyway, so he was found because of this tracking device. And wow, he was in trouble. And so he was brought in and he had to have surgery. So he's just got little nubs now uh, for his front feet. So we have to cut his food up in small pieces. He can't swim. So we have to keep his water at a depth where he can get his head out of. Uh, but he can move about. Uh, he's got very strong back uh, legs. And uh, turtles are one of the most resilient animals, I think, that are on Earth. They can overcome anything. I don't know of any other animal that can survive being hit by a car. I have seen turtles come in here that I have no idea how they're still alive. And then I've seen them be released. So they are just amazing. And we can learn so much from turtles. Um, just imagine that when they're hibernating, they're, they're down there hibernating for like six months of the year. Their heart rate goes from 30 or 40 beats a minute like it is now to one beat every 10 minutes when they're hibernating. And how do they do that? They have lungs, they need oxygen. Well, they get down at the bottom of the water, right down the bottom where it doesn't freeze and the water maintains a certain temperature. And of course, turtles being ectothermic, uh, the external temperature dictates the turtle's body temperature. So their body temperature will drop to that, the temperature of the water down there at the bottom. Their heart rate slows down to one beat every 10 minutes. And how do they get oxygen? Well, they need a certain amount. They have one opening at the back, uh, one orifice, and we call it the cloaca. And it is uh, surrounded with hundreds of blood vessels. And it is like a pulsating when they are hibernating. And just the water passing by this opening, this cloaca, uh, turtles can actually take an oxygen from the water that way. Yeah, so quite amazing. And um, oh, there's my little buddy. <laughs> Oh, Mr. Dean, you're so cute. It's a cute snapping turtle. So I'm going to put Rusty back. And I want to show you a Blanding's turtle. This is Andrea. 
and uh, she is a female Blandings turtle. So again, we have a turtle with a high dome shell. So the females, as I said, the females will always be con convex. You can see that it's flat and flush. Now, if Andrew was a male, it would be concave or plastered on like Rusty's was. So the Blandings turtle is that threatened species. This is the turtle that we have our research with uh, that we're doing here at the center. We're in our 10th year. Uh, so we're using radio telemetry to uh, track these turtles. And uh, this is the only species that has that yellow chin and throat. They kind of, they have that upturned uh, mouth there. It looks like they're smiling all the time. So some people call this turtle the turtle that swallowed the sun uh, or the smiling turtle. Uh, Andrea was hit by a car uh, quite a few years ago now. She suffered some serious head trauma though. Uh, her fracture is healed up quite nicely. But unfortunately, uh, the accident left her blind. So she did lose her right eye and her left eye uh, has no vision. So of course, uh, she would not be a good candidate to be released. We know where she's from. Uh, she came here because of the accident, uh, but uh, she's blind. She would have a hard time. She's old enough to be laying eggs. She'd be traveling across roads, trying to hide from predators, find food. So we have a special permit from the ministry for Andrea. Now, Andrea being a Blandings turtle, let's take a look at her plastron. Now you can see that Andrea can easily be tracked into her shell. Now this species has a hinge too, like the little stink pot turtle, but much more developed. So uh, if you follow my finger here, this is where the hinge is right across here, this whole section. So Andrea can bend this. You can see how it's moving when I go like this. See that? She can do that herself. So she will retract into her shell and just by using a few muscles, she can actually close that up pretty close to her carapace. So just for added protection. So this is a beautiful Blandings turtle. Uh, we do call this turtle our wanderer. Uh, they've been tracked to travel up to seven kilometers in six months in an active season. They'll leave where they hibernate for the winter time and they will travel to where they're gonna spend some time in the spring and then on to their summer residence and then back to where they're gonna overwinter. Here we have the beautiful northern map. So this is the species. Uh, it's listed as special concern, like the snapping turtle and the painted turtle and the stink pot. Uh, this is the species that the beautiful pattern on its shell is named after that topographical map, just the contour lines on its shell. So check out uh, the back of its shell. It's kind of serrated here, jagged, sharp. That offers some protection. But check out his back feet, how wide webbed they are. Look at how strong they are when he's pushing and walking. This turtle here, uh, you'll only find this turtle in a river or a lake. Very strong swimmers. And um, now in this species, the female grows to be twice the size as the males. In a lot of turtle species, the female is a little larger than the male. This one is quite noticeable, but they're not all like that. The males in the snapping turtle species, they're larger than the females. But uh, check out the beautiful markings on this turtle. And um, of course, again, no injuries, right? Again, here we have a turtle that was kidnapped, taken from the wild. No history, so unfortunate, really. But let's take a look at his plaster on there. Beautiful markings. Again, this turtle here can retract into his shell. No nice protection. So why are we worried about turtles? What is the value of turtles? Like ho-hum, you know, a lot of people are like, well, gee, you only see them six months of the year. You know, and then when you do see them, they're here, they're gone, they're in the water, they're so shy, you can't really, you know, get a good look at them. Well, turtles have been around for 230 million years. And turtles are the caretakers of our waters. Uh, they help to keep our waters fresh and clean. How do they do that? Uh, turtles are omnivores, they eat meat and vegetation, and they eat carrion. So they spend their days forging in the water, looking for dead fish and dead animals and eating them, therefore keeping the bacteria levels down low in our water and therefore keeping our waters clean. And they are excellent seed dispersals too. They eat vegetation, they're eating the leaves, they're eating the seeds. 
And as they're going through their digestive system, those seeds, they're getting fertilized. And when they come out, they are floating in the water with the current. And a lot of them are attaching along the shoreline to the banks and new native uh, plants are growing. And those native plants, the roots are gonna help with soil erosion. They're gonna help to hold back flooding. They're gonna help with hold back sediments and they're gonna provide uh, protection for other animals and food for other animals. So great seed dispersals and the caretakers are the heartbeat of our wetlands. So now I think it's time to see some baby turtles. I want to show you some turtle hatchlings. We call them little hatchlings. Let's go check them out. McKenna and I, uh, we have a little nursery here set up for you to see and view these little hatchlings. I just got to change my gloves because I'm going to be uh, touching turtles that are going to be released in the wild. Let's check out where these hatchlings come from. Let's take a look at this x-ray. As I said, every turtle is x-rayed when they are admitted to the hospital. We're looking for injuries internal and we're looking to see if they have eggs. This is a female a snapping turtle. You can see the eggs and you can also see the turtle's uh, uh, vertebrate or spine here. Notice with the snapping turtle goes right down through here, way down into the tail. So please never lift, drag or pull a snapping turtle by its tail. Okay, so the eggs, so we have every turtle, when they're admitted to the hospital, we ask the finder where that turtle came from, that's on the turtle's chart. The turtle is given that very unique number, that goes on the turtle's chart. This is this female's a unique number, it's 18-346. It's on her chart, and on her chart now goes that she had 12 eggs. Now, we take those eggs, sometimes they lay them, sometimes we have to induce them, and then we can focus on fixing up the female and we're going to take the eggs and we're going to put them in an incubator and we're going to incubate the eggs for the mother. So we take those eggs and we put them in containers like this. This is just vermiculite. Of course, you know, there's more involved. We keep a certain moisture level. We put a lid on that has a holes for air circulation and we put them in incubators and it takes around 50 some days and then they hatch. But we need to know what mother owns these eggs because we need to know where these hatchlings are going to be released when it's time for them to be released in the wild because that's our goal and mission is to get every turtle here rehabilitated and back to the wild. So we are going to take this mother's, the mother from these eggs, we're going to take her number here, we're going to make a label and we're going to stick that on the front of this container here before it goes into the incubator. And now we know, we just got to look at the chart and we know now where these little hatchings are gonna be released when it comes time. So you can see how very important it is for us to know the location of an injured turtle. It could mean many turtles. So here we are in our nursery and uh, McKenna and I, we have five species that we can show you. We don't have all eight because, well, as you know, some of them are in danger and we just don't have so I'm going to show you first uh, Northern Map. Uh, you just saw Mappy with the beautiful contour lines. I like to show you what uh, he looked like when he was just a hatchling. Now all these hatchlings are going to be released very soon. I'm going to be releasing some next week and so is McKenna. So all of our staff and volunteers are going to be releasing turtles. So I'm going to just get out a little Northern Map here for you. And this one here, so and there we are. So this is uh this is what Mappy looked like. You can see the colors are quite vibrant at this age. So as they grow and mature and they're basking out in the sun, the colors are soon going to fade and change. But you can still see very noticeable are there those black and yellow stripes. And you can see his little back feet are developing quite nicely into those large web feet for life in the river or lake. Well, let's take a look at his plaster on his bottom shell. Whoa, look at the beautiful markings. So you can see this turtle can easily retract and hide in its shell. Mm -hmm. and he's ready to go for sure. Okay, 
The next species I'm going to show you is a little painted turtle. A little midland painted. We have another subspecies and it's called the western painted. Uh, that's on the uh, edge of Ontario and Manitoba. It's a little larger species. They have one here actually. It came in. So here we have the little midland painted turtle. You can easily tell them they have the beautiful red markings on the on the bridge there, very noticeable on their limbs, on their legs, yellow on their head. <laughs> Let's look at the bottom shell here. So you can see each species, different patterns, and all these shapes, the sizes, the colors, the patterns, they all help the turtle to hide from predators and of course prey in their habitat. And now I'm gonna show you a Blandy's tattoo. Remember Andrea? Uh, the species that I showed you earlier that had the yellow chin and throat, and she's blind. This is what Andrea looked like when she was a hatchling. So this is the species that we are doing our field study with. And so we're trying to, come, you know, see like, uh, you know, if really keeping them for, you know, a few years, if that's a viable way to bring their the blandings numbers back up to historical levels. We're trying to determine which is the best stage of life that we can release them. So this is the species that has that uh, hinge. Although when they're young like this, a little hatchling, they can't use that, it's not developed yet. But by the time they're five years old, they will. Now this little turtle here, it will not be old enough to lay eggs 20 years from now. This little turtle's gotta survive for 20 years, stay hidden, and only then will she be old enough to be laying eggs. And we have these babies here because they came inside injured females. Most likely, if these females had dug the nest and laid their eggs, these babies wouldn't be here because of the predators. So our hatching program is very important. And I'm gonna show you a little stink pot uh, hatchling. They're adorable but they will bite you. They're very, uh, I think it's just because they're such a small little turtle. So you have to be careful with them and that's okay. So this is the little stink pot. Remember the one that has those two paired glands tucked up here by their marginal scoots? There's a little leg coming out there. Hello, little guy. Now, when these little turtles, when they, we hatch them in incubators, they're not ready to go in water right away as soon as they come out of the egg. They still have what we call a yolk sac on their abdomen. And that, you can notice it, it's like a little button. And it's full of nutrients and vitamins from the egg. The little hatchling has to absorb that first before we introduce them to the water. It's just because they hatch earlier in the uh, incubators than they do out in the wild. Out in the wild, it takes 80 to 90 days because of the fluctuation in temperature. Uh, but so here they hatch sooner. So we just have to wait and then they're introduced to water. And the last one I'm gonna show you is the snapping turtle actually. And of course they're gonna be much larger because they are our largest freshwater turtle. Here is a little snapping turtle hatchling. Let's check out his tail. So you can see those bony protrusions. They have a very dragon-like looking tail. And at the back, they're jagged and serrated like Mr. D's was. And that's gonna offer protection from predators coming up from behind. That might be pretty rough on a, a fish's mouth or a big bullfrog. And you can see that they have three ridges, one down the center, one on each side. They're pretty rough too for my finger. 
And uh, let's check out that large head. Well, they have that hooked beak and they have those little barbs on the chin, like the little stink pot turtle. And of course they have that reduced plastron. You can see the little bridge here that holds the two pieces together, gives it its strength. So now it is time for a question period. I'm just going to get everything together here before I leave this room. All my stuff. I want to just thank you, Wendy, for sharing the the tour of the center with us. Um, it was just great to see inside and hear about everything that goes on in there, and uh, of course, meet your turtle ambassador. So thank you very much for that. Um, is it best if I just read off some of these questions here? Absolutely. Okay. So the first one um, was about that first snapping turtle that you showed us, they wanted to know how old it was and how long for its recovery. Oh, you now it's really hard to age a snapping turtle. Uh, I would say it would be an educated guess, but I would say that that turtle's probably around 24, 25 years of age, something around that age, could be 30. So I'd say maybe anywhere from 25 to 30 years of age. That injury is gonna take quite a while to heal up because of course the damaged beak I mean, that, that, that's huge. So when that turtle first came in, we had to tube feed the turtle and uh, we are uh, introducing it to fish. So it is gonna take a while, but, and you notice that it has one eye, uh, the other eye was severely damaged, but we can release the turtle. If they have one functioning eye, that is fine. And um, so we have, uh, we know that that turtle is going to finally be released because we have seen many, many uh, snapping turtles just in that, uh, sort of a situation. That is a common injury. Uh, we usually, we get in quite a few turtles, uh, snapping turtles every year, just like that. They just need time. And, um, but very quickly, um, they do form that cartilage underneath that, um, uh, you know, epidermis that uh, forms uh, a protective water barrier very quickly. So no water is gonna get into the turtle's lungs, but um, it does take quite a while. So we need to see that turtle eating on her own. That's the big thing right, right now is for her to be eating on her own and have a healthy, um, you know, appetite. So we're still working on that with her and monitoring that. Uh, we monitor all the food that turtles eat here. Any food that's left over, that's documented. So we can easily and quickly look at the chart and see, you know, if they're improving or, or not. But We've had snapping turtles here for over three years, so she will be here mm -hmm. until that day comes that she can wow. be removed. Yeah. Yes, as some of the people that are watching um, might remember a snapping turtle that came with a, an injury um, similar to the one that that turtle was, has experienced. And um, it was it was flown to your center actually. And uh, I, that happened in the summer and then it was uh, released back to that same spot the following spring, so. Yes, yes. Um, okay, what about the painted turtle that you showed us that had the wire? Are those wires removed once the turtle shell is healed? Yes, they are. So all that wire is gonna be removed, removed prior to the turtles being released. So we're gonna remove that, you know, probably about a month prior to them being released. So uh, we have quite a few uh, adult turtles now that are in the stages of being re released. So we would take, you know, a week or so um, going around getting them ready for release date. And that's when our, our vet, our doctor would be removing all that wire. And then of course, uh, we go around and we make sure that uh, every turtle has a microchip too. So we'll spend a good few weeks microchipping all the turtles that are gonna be released and uh, removing all of that hardware and all those fasteners. Now, another fastener type that uh, our doctor uses too, it's not always only the orthopedic wire, that, we use that around the marginal scoots where there's no flesh, but our doctor uses this method too. And these are fasteners that are glued onto either side of the fracture. 
And then, so we want to keep that fracture together. And this is just um, plastic zip ties or wire ties that are pulled through. And that there will keep that fracture close together until it mends and fuses. And then of course, this is just removed before the turtle is released. This is, this is very good too, a very good method as well. Okay, uh, the next question, Wendy, is when should you let nature heal the wound and when should your, you and your center be called? We have seen injured turtles on a golf course hit by a mower or cart and it is heading back to the pond fairly well. Do we, do we help them back or seek assistance? Seek assistance, please. Uh, uh, yes, infection can definitely set into that wound, like especially snapping turtles. They're usually the ones you're gonna see on golf courses and they're gonna be going back into that muck and murk and definitely infections can set, set in and uh yeah and, and then you're going to get leeches in there and things like that and possibly even maggots so it is always best if you can secure the turtle please to bring, bring it in and um yeah and and we will look after that turtle and make sure that everything is healed up that uh you know it receives everything that it needs so i would definitely say bring it in yeah Okay, and how do you know they are in pain and what do you treat them with? Severity of injury signs. Yeah, uh, well, um, let's say we give them Medicam for one thing and, uh, and then other drugs that our doctor uses that uh, only our doctor would be able to use. Uh, we use, um, uh, some of them give, we give them antibiotics and that is if say they have been um, injured by a predator like a fox, like their teeth in their mouth or your dog, that's when we're gonna give them antibiotics because there's so much bacteria in an animal's mouth. Or we have um, um, cream that we will put on, like uh, flamazine that we will put on the turtles uh, for any kind of uh, an infection on their shell. And uh, what was the other question, what was it? Um, How do you know they're in pain? Oh yes, okay. Well, um, we know that there are nerve endings and blood vessels in the turtle shell. As soon as you touch a turtle shell, they can feel that. And when they're in pain, they will uh, just, they will retract into their shell and they will be very uh, lethargic. And, and then they can do just the opposite too. They can become very, very active after a, an injury, almost like they're going into shock. Mm -hmm. So we know just because there are nerve endings and blood vessels in the shell, although they can't vocalize or tell us just because an animal or a being can't tell you that they're in pain. We know that they're mu they must be, and we're not gonna risk that. Uh, we're going to uh, make sure that they're as comfortable as possible, and uh, we're going to offer them pain medication or pain management. Okay. Um, with the reduction to protection laws, how much strength is there to protecting still in place? How much strength? Well, if, if you do see anybody like doing anything that seems to be a little suspicious to you, yes, report it to the Ministry of Natural Resources and, and Forestry. Please follow through and do that. Um, and I know that, that here, I have been here uh, working and I have had officers contact me and they've actually went and confiscated, you know, snap material hatching from somebody from the hotline. Somebody tipped them off. So they definitely will go out and they will enforce it. You know, so you need to, you know, re report anything that's sus suspicious or if you know of anybody that, you know, has taken a turtle from the wild and have them as a pet, please report that. Um, and the next question is, is there a way for us to protect eggs from predators? Yes, there is. Uh, so here at the center, we do sell turtle nest protectors, but believe me, if you go on, um, our, our website, I've got instructions or directions on how to make them yourselves. Uh, we do uh, sell them here just for uh, funding for our center because we are a registered charity. And uh, so I'm gonna show you one here. This is what we do. And it's untreated wood. Please remember it's gotta be untreated wood. And it is just two by fours. We make a frame. And uh, we put in with ours, we've got a little brochure that tells you all about a nest protection, improving the odds for eggs and hatchlings, the importance of doing that. You know, uh, predation is huge, uh, especially with raccoons and that. So here you can see the, uh, the nest on the ground. And let me just pull it out here. So you need spikes. 
either eight or 10 inch spikes. Uh, I've got two different sizes here, whatever you want. So when you make the frame, uh, you can see that on every side, you want to have an exit for the turrets, for the hatching. They need to have a way to escape. When they come out, they need to be able to get out. Uh, the top of these is just hardware cloth. You can get it in different sizes. I like this, uh, you know, uh, small. And we just put uh, screws and washers, but you don't have to do that. You have a good quality staple gun. You can just cut the hardware cloth and staple it all around yourself. And uh, the spikes, what we do is we drill holes down through each, and that's for the, uh, the um, spikes to go through. Because uh, believe me, predators are very determined. I've even seen them bur burrow and try to dig underneath. And if you do, and we do uh, put a little flag there too, just so that you know where the turtle's nest is. And uh, you want to make sure that uh, when you do install it, that uh, there's no vegetation uh, covering, you know, keep these, these little holes free from vegetation. And you want to leave the turtle nest protector on until late fall. Please don't remove it. You know, I know I've heard a lot of people leave it on for a couple of weeks or a month. You know, I've done it all. Uh, predators are determined. And whatever that scent is that the female leaves behind or that, that the hatchlings under the ground, what they're sending off that predators can pick up on, it's incredible. They won't, they are relentless. And I've done it all, like a month to two months, you know, and uh, no, I leave the turtle nest protectors on until late, late fall, until October, or be just before the snow. And then I'll go and remove them if they're in my way. If they're not in my way on my property, I'll leave them there because uh, we have species that overwinter. Uh, one that overwinters is the painted turtle. Uh, the painted turtle can lay two clutches a season and they will overwinter like when they hatch. Um, if it's too cold, those little uh, hatches, they have almost like a built-in antifreeze that prevents the cells from freezing completely. And they will stay in that nest chamber until the following spring and then emerge. And, um, and the snapping turtle will try to do that too. And so will the northern map, although they're not as successful as the painted turtles are. But for the turtle nest protectors, uh, they're for your private property. We stress that unless you can get permission from a park to make sure you've got permission that you've got solid proof, then you can install them. But you can do this to uh, actually, this makes a huge difference. Um, and it's quite interesting if you're there. Remember, if you do do this, uh, don't be alarmed if they don't emerge from the nest uh, that fall, which can usually be around the end of August right through the month of September, uh, right through into maybe late September. It all depends on the weather. But don't be alarmed and don't be concerned if you don't see any hatchlings because they could overwinter. And whatever you do, please do not start digging up a nest because you don't see hatchlings. That is illegal. Putting a nest protector over the nest is not illegal. Digging up the nest is. Mm -hmm. Uh, okay, Wendy, I think that covers most of the questions. Uh, some, some people have had to leave, but lots of uh, thank you, excellent uh, information and presentation. And uh, I want to just thank you as well. It, that was just a wealth of information. And um, I always learned something new about turtles. So it was just really great. And we're so lucky to have the center and all the volunteers working to help to protect turtles. So I just have a few more slides and then um, that will kind of conclude our presentation. And like I said, I will be sending out a recording uh, in a few days. So you'll have this information. There'll be some links coming. Um, the uh, center's website is included. So if you go to that, you'll see what number you need to call if you find an injured turtle. So um, if there's nothing else, I will uh, give you a break, Wendy. Thank you so much. And then I'll just uh, uh, share my screen for these last few slides. Well, thank you very much for supporting the Ontario Turtle Conservation Centre by booking this virtual tour. We're very grateful and we could not do what we do here without you. So thank you very much. And I hope that everybody shares what they did learn tonight. If they learned a few extra things, share them with their friends and family. And please watch for turtles. This is the busy time. And uh, 
Thank you again for all your support. And I wish you a good night. Bye Thank for you. now. Thank you, Wendy. Bye-bye. Okay, so for those of you who um, are still able to stick around, I just have a few last slides that I'd like to share. Um, just really quick, three things um, you can do to help turtles. So number one, and Wendy mentioned this, watch for turtles on the road. And this is especially important from May to October because they've come out of hibernation and they're moving around you know, across roads. Uh, to different wetlands or to find suitable nesting sites. So you really need to watch, um, have a look for these turtle crossing signs because that is a good indication that turtles might be out on the road in those areas. And like Wendy mentioned, if it is safe to do so, help them across the road in the direction they are headed. That's really important. Number two is create and protect local wetlands. So think about your own property. Do you have space where you could create or enhance a wet area and provide habitat for turtles? Not everyone can do that, but maybe maybe you do have the space. So think about that and uh, contact uh, Asabo Bayfield Conservation and uh, we will put you in touch with our wetland specialist and there might also be grants available to help you do that. And lastly, and probably most important is to be a turtle advocate. So this means tell others about turtles, tell them about this presentation you watched tonight and how important it is to protect them and their wetlands. So speak up about wetland protection. This is really important. And if you um, have heard in the news recently, there was a situation in the GTA where there was a big company that wanted to develop in a wetland and it was due to public outcry and letters, calls, petitioning, um, just talking to their elected officials um, and letting them know that this, this wasn't right, this development and that company um, decided not to develop in that wetland. So I know sometimes we think, you know, one person can't do much, but uh, it really can help. So the, this slide just uh, provides a few additional resources. As I mentioned, uh, if you go to our website, we have a wetlands page and then a turtle page. Uh, just new this year is we developed an online reporting form. So if you go to our website, you'll be able to report the turtles that you see. And um, here's the link to the Ontario, the Ontario Turtle Conservation Center. So if you click on this link, um, you will be able to see the number to call about injured turtles. Um, one thing to remember is that you don't have to get the turtle to Peterborough, they have a system of volunteers um, who help get the turtle there. Um, you just need to start the process. And then uh, this link here is for uh, building a turtle nest protector, uh, similar to the one that uh, Wendy showed. And then I've also included a link to how to safely move turtles across roads like Wendy demonstrated. So. Um, if you just want a refresher on that, you can go ahead and watch that. So I'm going to stop sharing, um, just having another look at our questions, but I think that's it, unless anyone else has anything. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, I'm not for sure uh, when we'll get the recording out, but I hope to in the next few days and um, then you'll have all that information. And if you have any questions about anything, please don't uh, hesitate to contact me um, and we'll get you in touch with whatever information you need. Okay, bye everyone.